open up your Bibles today, the book of Matthew, to chapter 25. This is a familiar passage of scripture, but it vividly demonstrates the point I'm trying to make today. I mentioned this yesterday in, my, in one of my teachings on prayer. The enemy does not care how he hinders you. Through death, through trial, tribulation. What, what the purpose of the enemy is in your life is to keep you from ever manifesting the ultimate glory that God has for you and for your life. And if he can do it through depression or discouragement or rejection, he will use any method that he knows about. And, and I see this so often, and, I, and I've always emphasized how important your children are, the lives of your children. Mo most of the problems in church life is that we are kind of in grown-up bodies manifesting childhood hurts, wounds, things that mom and dad and family members and siblings and schools and teachers and professors did to us, and most of us are still struggling with those things today. I mean, your absolute altitude for success is based on that concept. Your, your earning power is based on that concept. You know, I was thinking about this. The, the, the filament for a light bulb, it took Edison 2,000 attempts to come up with the right combination that would light up a light bulb for any length of time, for any reasonable length of time. What if he would have said, I'm going to quit after 1,800 times? What if he would have just said, I've had it, I quit? Most of the fabulous techniques of surgery today, I mean, I've lived in my short life to see them come into being. Well, one of the first patients that experienced a hip operation was my father, my dad. And the man who performed that operation was the man who invented it in England. And he did it at the Good Samaritan Hospital and replaced a, a painful hip. And now, it, now it's common knowledge. Now it's, it's done daily. Uh, um, Dr. Bernard you can, most of you can remember if you're up in a few years, he transferred a baboon heart into a baby. The baby, I think, lived six weeks. A baboon heart. But I've experienced two open heart surgeries, and without that preliminary work that he did, Bernard did, I wouldn't be alive today. You, you were destined, when you had heart problems that we experience today, you were destined to an early death. And so, so we need to understand how vital and how important it is that we understand the workings of the devil. Let, let me read my passage to you here. Go, go to, the, to the 14th verse. of Matthew I don't know if I messed up here and got to Matthew 24 25 yeah I've written down the uh, the wrong uh, deal I'll, I'll, I'll just it's, it's the story or the parable of stewardship. And you know the story well, and 
God tells three men to receive finances. Two of them wisely invest the money that they had received and double it. One because of fear hid his into the ground and was rebuked severely because he didn't invest wisely what had been given to him and enhance its value, increase its value, and was told, frankly, he was, he was basically resigned to an eternal hell and told to relinquish the money that had been given to him, taken from him and given to the man who had earned the most out of the, out of the first two who had earned the most that had been given to him. Now, now th that might be seemingly unfair. Well, that seems so unfair that he, he not only lost what was given to him, but it was taken and given to a man who had already earned double. That's smart business. I mean, if, if you were the one that was investing in those three individuals, which individual would you reinvest in? You would reinvest in the one who earned the most. That's just good business. In, in other words, he had potential, but he never reached his potential. Now, never, never forget this point. It is God who gives skills, but, but not without men's hands. Have you ever known anything to come to pass without God investing in someone? There was a man, and, it, and people look for his violins today. Stradivarius. Antonio Stradivarius. What would there be a violin called a Stradivarius, if there wasn't an Antonio? Some of you are shaking, yes, I don't know how. He invented it. He made it. That, that's the whole point of life. God has created you with special gifts that no one else has. But if you don't use them, they're of no value to anyone. Waste it. You can waste them on alcohol, you can waste them on drugs, you can waste them on anything. The enemy doesn't care. It's sort of like this. We're a, we're a, a computer generation. I'm not. I, I don't know how to turn one on. I don't know if that's a curse or a blessing, but I sure rest when I don't rest when I'm around a computer because even those that know how to use the computer, it, it's got so many glitches in it. And if you know me well, I'm not a patient man and I'm in a hurry for things and it drives me nuts. But let me ask you this question. What, what if I said to you, go out and each of you buy a $3,000 computer. And then the first thing you do is go over to a trash can and throw it in the trash can. What, what would you think of me? You'd say, well, I think you're nuts. I think you're crazy. What's the difference if we take a life, if we take a child... And through our actions, through our relationships with them, it would be like taking a $3,000 computer, walking over to a trash can, and throwing it in a dumpster. What's the, what's the difference? They're, they're never going to reach their potential. They're never going to reach their glory that God had intended for them because we destroyed it. We shipwrecked it.
And so no one would do that. No one would purchase a $3,000 computer and then trash can it. There's a city in Mexico, Oaxaca. When you come into that city, there are 30,000 children living on top of a dump. I asked this church many years ago to invest, I don't know how many thousands of dollars, into a ministry in Tijuana, and the sole ministry of that woman was when she went down to Tijuana, she went up to the Tijuana dump, which is a mountain of trash, because there were children and women living in little cardboard houses on top of this dump, and she administered shots, to the children, to protect them from diseases. And the chances are, I wouldn't be able to tell you how many thousands of those children died from living on dumps that were infested with probably every kind of disease known to man. Scrounging for food, trying to eat, trying to stay healthy, trying to dig for anything that had any value at all. 30,000 in this particular city. 30,000. That will never reach their potential. Never attain the glory that God had for their lives. In Rio de Janeiro, 3 million children live on the streets. I think it was in San Paulo that they got tired of children coming up to the tourists and begging. So they gave an order to the local police department, pick them up, take them out in the hills, and shoot them. Can you, th- can you imagine the potential? Can you imagine the glory? Can you imagine all that these children would have manifested or could have manifested if treated with respect and right, and the world would understand how important it is, and that God is a God of glory, and through our glory, He receives glory. We should treat our children as if they're the richest thing on this earth. You know, if I said to you, where do you think the richest area is in the world? Probably you would say two things. The diamond mines of South Africa are the gold mines of South America. That's the way we think. But really, the richest areas of the world are cemeteries. They're, They're full of people who never reached their potential. They slept it away. They sloughed it away. They lazied it away. They drugged it away. They drank it away. So they went to the cemeteries with all of their potential. Unwritten songs. Unwritten poetry. Unsolved medical problems. I I don't want to put anyone under bondage because thank God God is a redeemer and all the babies have been aborted are in heaven. but we probably have aborted the answer to many of the physical problems already, just just in the few short years that we've been practicing abortion. Millions and millions and millions of untapped potential that we thought, well, that'll solve our birth control. We, we use death as a, as a salvation and an answer for birth control. How stupid could we be? And I, I know this isn't politically correct. I, I know that there are groups out there that would love to hear this and picket this church. What am I saying today in a long roundabout way? Society has dumped glory into the garbage heaps. We're doing it as parents. How many times 
Have you heard this as a child? You'll never amount to anything. You're just like your old man. That's what we're feeding into our children. I know I know Christians who are more venomous than rattlesnakes. It, it, it would be like we're keeping pet rattlesnakes in our house, but we're trying to make sure they don't hurt anybody. You know, I, I explain this all the time. People say, I don't know where they ever got this. They said, Well, I can't I can't leave my mate. God, God hates divorce, and he does. Paul doesn't even deal with divorce. Paul deals with, he says, for the sake of peace, leave. Leave. You, you don't have to be married to an abusive Christian who is driving your children into an eternal hell you got an out. Paul says, depart for them for the sake of peace. I'm not advocating divorce. Paul doesn't even mention divorce. Je By the way, Jesus doesn't miss and mention divorce or remarriage. It was already settled under Mosaic law. Pre premature termination in death is the death of potential. Am I making sense to anybody out there today? Premature termination terminates your potential. How, how, how Satan destroys that potential, he can destroy it emotionally, he can destroy it in your mind. He, he can so torment a teenager, and they become so fed up that they cut their wrists, they kill themselves, they hang themselves. Their glory is gone. Their potential is gone. Anything that they're going to produce, it, it would be like, it would sort of be like this. It would be like any food crop, wheat, barley, apples. It would be like me getting up and saying, whatever you do, Take all the apple seeds that you can find and destroy them. What would be the end result of that? What, 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 is the, what is the full glory of an apple seed? Anybody know? It's the full glory of an apple seed. An apple. So if I said to you, destroy all apple seeds at any cost, we wouldn't have apples. You wouldn't be able to go to Washington and see beautiful apple trees in bloom. And, and one, one apple seed could grow an entire grove. That, that's what this man was trying to get across to the church. You know, he, he brought out some really revolutionary things to me. When I read them, I had to go back and read them again. He said, in the Garden of Eden, they didn't pray. They didn't have to pray. They were in full fellowship with God. What, what would they pray about? They didn't speak in tongues. They didn't, they didn't do this. They didn't have to. And I thought about this. Someday in heaven... There'll be no prayer. What, what would you pray about in heaven? It's done. It's finished. It's over. But the one thing that he points out in the Garden of Eden is that, and I preached on this many, many times, they were task-orientated. They were told to tend the garden. They were told... To grow, to multiply. And the one thing that I brought out about this man's teaching, wh where do you become? Where does this seed begin to develop? Where, 
Where is there a place that we don't kill the seed of glory? It was in the environment of Eden. That was an environment. That was a place. That was a support from God. God walked with them daily, and they fellowshiped with him. And once Satan entered and broke that chain of fellowship, what was the first thing they did? They hid from God. They ran from God. They said, we don't want to talk to God anymore. I can tell immediately when somebody is backsliding in my congregation. The first thing they begin to do is they stop coming. They stop fellowshipping. They cut off relationship with God and with song and worship and guys like Michael. And so the wealthiest spot on earth is not diamond mines, not gold mines, not higher institutions of learning. It's cemeteries. Isn't that sad? Graveyards all over the world are the great repositories of lost treasures. Unwritten books, unpainted paintings, uncomposed poetry, unreleased potential. Every day, thousands of people go to their graves without ever revealing their unfulfilled glory. And we think of all kinds of ways to expedite that process. Well, well, name a few. Television. There is so much mundane, mindless... Please forgive my French. Crap on TV that is unbelievable. And we watch it. We just, and, our, and we use that as a babysitter for our children... And then we wonder, you know, Sam's begging us. We, we, ought, we ought to run to those tables and say thank you to the teachers. My, my two children are not just a product of Charlene and me. They're a product of the teachers that taught them over the years. And isn't this strange? This is the opposite of what Satan tries to make you believe. As long as we are alive, get this, as long as we are alive, the possibility exists for us to reach our full potential. I mean, used to, I would have got a big amen out of that. Did you hear that? As long as we are alive, as long as we can build life into those children, those babies, as long as we can shield them from the disgusting, sickening, religious malarkey that sometimes people try to shove down their throat, we've, we've kept them alive. They've got a chance to fulfill their total potential. How many times has the devil said, it's all over for you? You were too bad. You can't be redeemed. What happened in 586? I've taught on this many, many times on Wednesday night. What happened to Judah in 586? They were taken captivity. Who took them into captivity? Babylon. They, 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 they cleaned out the territories of Israel. Very few people were left. They were exported. They were turned into slaves. They were taken to foreign countries, taught new languages, told to eat these foods instead of those foods. Was God finished with them? No. He had a man called Daniel, and he used to use him with dreams and visions that most Christians don't even believe in anymore. 
And he said, after 70 years, I'm going to redeem you people from Judah. Now, God would do that with a whole nation, but he wouldn't do it with an individual. He won't do it with your children, my children, you, your life. Of course he will. God has endowed us all with gifts and talents and abilities. And he wants to use them for his glory. So what's the answer? We should start looking at ourselves from God's perspective. You're getting this for free. If you would go to some of those TV seminars, they'd charge you a minimum of $500 to let you listen to this. But when those people were walking into captivity, bound, they probably said, it's all over for me. There's no hope. I can't be redeemed. That's a lie. I'll read it to you. For, the Lord, for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you. And cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. You know, my, my theme yesterday in... in prayer was if we serve a sovereign God if we if we have a God who knows the beginning and the end the front to the back why bother praying I mean that, that sounds to me that on the surface it sounds foolish if God knows everything and he knows the outcome and he knows the end result why would you bother praying why wouldn't you just let it happen People who don't read the Bible think that way. But Isaiah wrote, and he wrote to Hezekiah, he wrote to him and said, get ready and prepare yourself, you're going to die. Do you remember that story? And he wept and he cried and he was sad. And he started praying. And God, God told him, I've heard your prayer and I'm going to extend your life by 15 years. So that tells me immediately that it pays to pray. And if prayer doesn't work, then Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the Messiah, was a fool because they say that he prayed much. He rose early to pray. Paul, who wrote more on election and predestination, prayed all the time. But you've got whole denominations that have convinced people well, if God knows everything, why bother praying? You've got whole denominations saying that the gifts of the Spirit are not needed anymore. They were only for the establishment of the first century church. I tell you, we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit more today than we've ever needed them in our life. When we got an uncontrollable president who can't keep his mouth shut, yelling and hollering to a nut in North Korea who's threatening to send missiles somewhere in America or to Guam, we better know how to pray. And I'm not saying Donald Trump is a bad man, but, you know, Donald, if you ever hear me, you need to zip it. You're dealing, you know, insane people. Like, like I say this all the time. I don't want to argue with drunks. You can't argue with a drunk. They won't shut up. I've had them come into the church. And people get really upset with me. And I'll say, they, they want to talk, take them out of the church, take them to my office, and talk to them. But I'm not going to argue with them in front of a crowd. 
That, that, I'd, be, I'd be stupider than them. And, and you know what? All you drunks out there, you know what I'm telling you is the truth. My brother was a drunk. You said the wrong thing to him, he'd send you to the hospital. Seriously. I'd be in a car with him. I'd be in a truck with him. A guy would walk across the crosswalk and happen to look, and my brother was going to get out and fight him. And I said, Joe, Joe, Joe. And I had two brothers who were drunks. One night, a police chief was talking to my dad and said, wow, we had a real problem last night. Two soldiers came into the, this bar and completely destroyed it. Well, we, he didn't even have to say it was my brother Elk and my brother Joe. And it was. That's what drunks do. Take them to a private office and say, you want to talk, but the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about your relationship with Jesus. The, the Bible says... The man who says there is no God is a fool. Why would you argue with a fool? Well, I want to argue with you because there is a God. No, you're not. He's a fool. <laughs> I'm pretty simple to understand. Just logic and common sense. The Bible's not hard to understand, but, you know, somehow we want to make it into something that it was never intended to be. But this goes on. It says, when you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. Notice he said, where I have driven you. I preached on laps in the wilderness a thousand times. You're in the wilderness because you need to learn something. We should have learned that in high school. Remember in high school? Phillips, take a lap. And I, I wouldn't learn, so I'd be taking laps all through the gym class. When you find yourself in the wilderness, it's because God is trying to teach you something. It's like I said yesterday. If I was, if I was in the construction business and every time I picked up a hammer, I missed and hit myself on the knee, finally I'd say to myself, I don't think I'm to be a carpenter. I don't think I ought to be in construction. How many times do we hit ourselves in the knee? How many times are we sawing with a saw, it skips, jumps up, and cuts your hand? Pretty soon you've got to say, I don't think I'm supposed to be doing this. I, I said this to our little TV audience yesterday. They, uh, I said, if you're asking me what you should pray for, this is the first thing I'd be praying for. God, what am I supposed to do? The, the problem with too many people is they're doing too many things that they don't like. They don't want to do it. Why do it? God created us to find satisfaction in our work. You're not happy if you don't have a personal love relationship. You can, you can say you are. You can pretend. Well, how can I find a personal love relationship? Find it with Jesus. We must learn to see ourselves again through God's perspective. What does God see in you? So try to find God's direction for your life first.
I, I have a really hard time learning in some things. I wrote this down. Perhaps you may have to walk in the wilderness in order to develop patience. I mean, God really worked on my patience on this trip. On the way home, I, I told Charlene, this is the air flight from hell. 12 to 13 hours in, on one plane that you can't get out of with screaming, crying babies. Charlene asks me this on every trip. When are you going to learn patience? And character. He's going to develop your character. Ecclesiastes 12 says, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. Before the difficult days come. We know what that means. And the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Too many people today have no pleasure in life. Miserable. But they, you know, it's amazing, no pleasure, but they always remember to tell you, but the joy of the Lord is your strength. And it's like, well, what happened to yours? Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken. Are the pitcher shattered at the fountain? Are the wheel broken at the well? Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. And, and in my point five, I put down seeds of glory. Little, little, a doctor or a pastor related, he was in a hospital. And he saw this doctor walking out of the pregnancy area of the hospital with a stainless steel bowl, and in that bowl was a, an aborted fetus. And he said how sad he was, how broken his heart was to know that in that bowl was all the potential, all the glory, everything that was possible for that child was gone. And I thought to myself, We've done that to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I, I mentioned this Wednesday. The thing I have the hardest thing with, with Christians. They're, they're, they're full of the Word and that's good. But they're not full of empathy or love or sympathy. It's like, you know, you're, you're, you're like a, a computer or a tape. How you doing? I'm sad. My heart is broken. My joy is being severely tested. And then click, and here comes the word. Blah, 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 blah. Like, like a machine gun. I'm glad you know the word, but you obviously are not sympathetic. You obviously do not have empathy. We're going to minister to people. The first thing Jesus ministered was empathy. Jesus wept. The seeds of glory seemingly are nothing until they reach full maturity. I've said this a hundred times in my preaching. Billy Graham was told, don't be a preacher, you'll never make it. Go home and do something else. Billy Graham, greatest evangelist that's probably ever lived, greater than even Paul. Some Yahoo who couldn't see the potential in him is telling him to drop out of Bible school, quit preaching, and go find something else to do. Millions have been saved. That, that song you sang today was one of his favorite songs that he used to sing at the Crusades. You know, I was probably told six months ago, one of 
Liz's boys wants to be a preacher. I meant, well, I was going to, we were going to bring him in here. We were going to, I should have brought him in here six months ago and sealed what God has already placed in his heart. And, and he's, a, he's a little boy. He's going to do things that are going to drive Liz nuts. But the answer is not to say, and God has called you to be a preacher. You'll never make it. Don't, don't do that. Man, if you would have known me as a kid, you would have said, he's the last candidate that would ever be a preacher. The seeds of glory seemingly are nothing until they reach maturity. Then all of a sudden it's like, what happened here? They matured. They grew. That's in your kids. That's in you. And all your gifts are, are different. My gifts are different than yours. Yours are different than mine. You, 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 you won't preach like me. You may, you may not even want to preach like me. But you've got to learn to recognize the worth of seeds. God looks past the obvious. He looks what, what is past to what can be. Maybe you're in the wrong profession. And all this message has been about today, if you didn't get it, don't die in seed. Don't die in seed. In God's name, don't die in seed. Well, well what can make me die in seed? Laziness. Neglect. Religiosity. Audacity, self-centeredness, egotist, egotism. Children, people, often die before reaching maturity, never revealing the fullness of who they could have been. That was my whole point in bringing out 30,000 little children, making a home on a dump. They die in seed. Their treasures are lost to the world forever. This is not God's design. There's glory in becoming. When, when, we, when we're a full-blown apple or a pear, are a peach. Shunnings from a family that raised wheat, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of wheat, as far as the eye can see. You'd, you can go there and you'll see at 3 o'clock in the morning some guys in a tractor, air-conditioned. But her family started out with 20 mule team. Can you, can you imagine thousands of acres? Plowing with 20 mule team. Great grandfathers, grandfathers, fathers, uncles. That's what they were born to do. That's, he loved that. Her grandfather loved that. Charlie Stevick loved that. God created us to find satisfaction in our work. And within that satisfaction, in that framework, you find personal love relationship. With who? With Jesus Christ. I've, I preach this a thousand times. You won't continue to serve 
God out of fear. You've got to serve God out of love. You'll master fear. I, see, I saw a guy jump out of an airplane without a parachute. And another guy jumped out of a, right after him with his parachute, caught him, gave it to him, he put it on and he opened it. What moron's going to jump out of an airplane? He mastered fear. You'll master fear. The, the thing that I deal with the most, and I have to tell the staff, people live in sin for so long, they actually begin to picture it as not sin. Well, but you don't understand. We loved each other. Brother, you're living in adultery. You need to make this right with God. Oh, no, no. And the family gets mad at me and the, all the kids don't like me. Sin is sin. Length of how long you are in sin doesn't change it. You change it. You come to your pastor and say, you know what? We've been living this way forever and ever and ever. It's time we made it right. The world isn't going to tell them. God does not want us to die in seed form. Sam's right. We, we ought to thank God for our teachers. And I'll close with this. Glorifying God means releasing our full potential. We do this in two ways. By the work we do every day and by, by pursuing a life of personal holiness. How, how would you like to be a pastor and, and there's long, 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 long term sin in your life then one of you dies. Now you got to figure out how to get the, this situation to where God accepts it and you can get him into heaven. No, that's what it comes down to. Why don't we just get right with God in the first place? And, and marriage seems to be common in that sense. Well, we love each other. We're soulmates. Then marry. Then get, get it right with God. Because I can't make it right. You know me. I can't keep my mouth shut. So then everybody ends up being mad at me. The one, the one thing I'm going to appreciate on the day of judgment, I don't think I'm going to hear very many people say to me, you never told me. They're going to say, thank you, Gary. I'm not in hell today because you had the guts to tell me the truth. Can you, can you imagine... Can you imagine relatives, uh, children, standing by so-called religious, motivated, godly parents, and they said, you never told me. You never lived it in front of me. You never, you never made it right, dad, mom. You were my father, but you abandoned me. We had, we had a brother who's a preacher who I loved dearly. He said yesterday, I had three children before I ever found Jesus Christ. I had three children out of wedlock. And I know one was aborted, so I'm as much of a murderer as she is. That, that took courage. That took, that took great courage. But his... 
but his, he's got two children that are alive today. But I wonder what they think. I, I wonder where they're at. I wonder what position they're in. And our tendency is to go out as Christians and preach to a lost and dying world. But what about our own families? What about those little ones that are standing at your feet? M many people that enter into that position, they don't come. P you, people say, well, what's happening here? They, they don't want to hear me. They want me to say it's okay. Oh, you found your soulmate? Well, praise God. No, you're a whoremonger. Well, I know the Bible forwards and backwards. Well, whoremongers sometimes know the Bible forwards and backwards. I, I know the biggest sinner in the world that knows the Bible forwards and backwards. It's called Satan. So that doesn't impress me. And it shouldn't impress you. 